Last year, I said that the internet was dead. Before that, I called what the internet has become a dark forest, a siloed and dangerous place. What was once catalogs and travel blogs circa 99 does now seem to be both dark and dead. I pointed the finger at generative AI, the revolutionary technology that was supposed to make all of our lives easier, but instead heaped an incomprehensible amount of slop upon us. I'll admit, I'm pretty fatalistic about it. However, there are now a small group of hackers raging against the machine, developing tools intended to defund and depose the AI systems that are sucking us dry. The internet as it exists now is a panopticon trying to sell what it sees, and what it sees is you. Human users are a farmed product. AI technology is clearly in a bubble. I want to pop the bubble. The watershed moment was the public release of ChatGPT. It was a large language model trained on, without exaggeration, most of the published text that exists on the internet. Millions of books, millions of hours of transcribed YouTube videos, millions of websites, all of Wikipedia. The model's surprising success at replicating human-like speech told every other AI company that if you want to compete in this space, you'll need a lot of data too. Once regular users realized that this meant the rest of the internet, even copyrighted material, the backlash began. Hundreds to thousands of the most visited, most maintained websites started adding an old technology to their pages, robot.txt, a voluntary compliance standard that would restrict access to automated AI data scrapers if the standard was followed. All of this happened very quickly in direct response to AI scrapers and their voracious appetites. Of course, almost just as quickly, the world's top two AI startups started ignoring robot.txt. This, apparently, was the final straw for a few anonymous hackers. It's time, according to them, to show the world that generative AI is all just smoke and mirrors. I want to pop the bubble, sabotage to cost them money. None of the AI companies are profitable, and poisoning their models to hurt performance and hopefully spook investors is the goal. I decided to make this piece after reading this Ars Technica interview with a one Aaron B, which I suggest you read in full, link in the description, who used an old cybersecurity tactic known as tar pitting to trap AI data scrapers who weren't just digesting everything in sight on websites, they were also pinging some sites millions of times a day, which cost the website developers time, money, and intellectual property. The tool Aaron created is called Nepenthes, after the carnivorous plant that digests anything unlucky enough to slip inside it. Having been worried about this problem for a while now, I reached out to Aaron to learn more about what they were doing. The quotes that follow are Aaron's words via our email exchanges, read aloud by an actor, as what they have created is deliberately malicious software intended to cause harm. First, what is a digital tar pit? The first of these programs was made by Tom Liston, who named it La Brea after the real tar pits in Los Angeles. Tom was trying to stop a worm from scanning his IP nonstop. Instead of doing something illegal, Tom decided to try to slow down the worm enough such that its spamming would be less effective, and therefore less desirable as a tactic. Quote, Now you have a chance to make their life more difficult, Tom explained. Aaron B. and Nepenthes have a similar, if a bit more, focused goal. Instead of rolling over and letting these assholes do what they want, make them have to work for it instead. Like real tar pits, the goal of Nepenthes is both to slow down AI scrapers like the La Brea program and to trap them on a website indefinitely like some helpless prehistoric megafauna. This costs the AI company time, it wastes their money, and it poisons their data sets, not just with raw data, but with nonsense. This is how it works. It's like an infinite maze or a hall of mirrors. You dedicate part of your website's URL space a directory or folder to Nepenthes, and make a link to it from somewhere else on your site. Then it generates a randomized page for just that URL that looks like a normal website and not something malicious. But every link generated in one of those pages links right back into the tar pit. This is a demonstration of Nepenthes working in real time. According to Aaron, having the page load with the speed of a Roadrunner modem in 1997 is on purpose. 
The deliberate slowdown has two purposes. First, to prevent the crawler from overloading your server. The delay also hurts the crawler. It takes a computer's resources to listen for the response, which, while the AI companies have massive amounts, they still don't have an infinite amount. And now, they are wasting some of that waiting to hear from the tar pit. You'll also notice the page slowly fills in. Nepenthes is trying to send the crawler just barely enough to stay on the line instead of disconnecting. So, an AI comes to your website, not knowing that it's tiptoeing around the rim of a carnivorous plant. Eventually, it will find the link you've made to the tar pit. Once inside, there's no way out. Every single link sinks it deeper into the sticky muck. Aaron says that eventually, the download queue for the crawler is almost entirely web pages from the pit, pages that outnumber the legitimate pages on your entire website. Nepenthes isn't just an infinitely deep well for AI to fall into. It's a poisoned well, tainted with so-called Markov babble. The backlash against AI scrapers isn't so much about the web crawling in general. That's how we search the internet in the first place. It's about knowing that your data is being fed into something that will turn some of your creativity into slop. So Aaron added an old program to Nepenthes that makes the tar pit bubble up babble instead of useful data. A Markov babbler is a very simple text generation algorithm, often used as a computer science or programming lesson. The goal is generating new text that is statistically identical to the source material it's trained on. Aaron gave me this example. Start with a sentence like, and this and that. The Markov babbler wants to generate text based on this training data that is statistically identical. 50% of the time, the word and is followed by the word this, and 50% of the time it is followed by the word that. 100% of the time, this is followed by and, and 100% of the time, that is the end of the sentence. So give the babbler the word this, and it's very likely to spit out something like this and that and this and that, Aaron tells me. Now imagine that instead of giving it a single sentence, very similar to large language models, you give it a lot of text to reference. Then you prompt it, and if it's only trying to output similar sentences and not answer questions like ChatGPT, what you get back is nonsense. This is the tar that Nepenthes feeds to any AI ignoring robot.txt on your website. There isn't much new in Nepenthes, honestly. Dropping the Markov generator in was a whim for the fun of it. I'm unsure how effective it is as a poison, but who cares? Let's go. I told Aaron in our email exchanges that, frankly, it feels like there's some Fight Club-style anarchy to these tools. Why poison them all? Why burn it all down? Surely there's a less malicious way to do this. They responded, like many observers of the tech space are doing right now, that something has to show these giant companies that this space is a bubble, and it's about to burst. AI technology is clearly in a bubble. It doesn't work. It's spicy autocomplete. There's no cognition there. It's just attempting to guess the most probable next word. That's where these hallucinations and other bullshit they spit out comes from. Humans have an innate tendency to assume anything showing enough entropy to have free will or consciousness. LLMs are pretty much optimized to trigger it, and that's all that's happening. Do you think a Markov babbler will ever be sentient? Why would an LLM ever reach general AI when a Markov model cannot? It's all just smoke and mirrors. Aaron isn't the only one making these tar pits. In their interview, Ars Technica also spoke to others who are cross-pollinating their ideas with the digital Nepenthes plant. Another is called Iocane, after the famous poison from the Princess Bride. But ultimately, right now, Nepenthes, Iocane, and other tar pits are old tools being used to fight a new, giant enemy. It's inevitable that billion-dollar efforts to scrape data from every corner of the internet will adapt to and or avoid these pits entirely. But even after his program gained decent traction on social media, Ars Technica, and other spaces, for Aaron, Full-scale digital warfare isn't the goal. This was less sounding an alarm and more of a whim that took on a life of its own. It's kind of art, honestly. Just an expression of rage at what the internet has turned into. Lashing out because I can, regardless of effectiveness. I will definitely continue to maintain the Panthes as long as it takes. I'm guesstimating via downloads, somewhere around 50 to 250 instances of Nepenthes are currently out there in the wild. I think it's pretty cool. 
people like it and are using it. I have included a link to Nepenthes in the comments below. It comes with many warnings, and it doesn't mince words. Its goal is to accelerate AI model collapse and see them burn. Do not deploy Nepenthes if you aren't fully comfortable with what you're doing. My choice in highlighting this work could also be dangerous, but I wanted to speak with Aaron because I'm worried about the same things. The dead internet, in shitification, AI slop, brain rot. Like social media before it, in its current iteration, AI is a grand social experiment being performed on us without our consent. I don't want to move fast and break things when what's broken is the social contract. Tools like Nepenthes are an opening salvo in the coming battle for our digital lives. We can fight back even if we don't succeed. Be indigestible. Grow spikes. Until next time.